Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here this morning. I arrived to Riga a couple days ago. Weather was great. Uh, you have a very beautiful city, and I'm really enjoying my time here. So thank you so much for inviting me to this great conference. And hello again. I came here today to talk to you about um, state-sponsored attacks. Um, this, is, this has been a very interesting topic for me uh, to research and discuss for, for many, many years uh, because, you know, technology really changed the way we do intelligence and the way we kind of do spy or even warfare. So if in the past when you wanted to spy uh, on another country, you had to um, maybe train a very... Uh, you know, a very, very skilled uh, spy to go behind lines and to have disguise and to have this very, very good cover story. So today in the digital world, all you really need is a small tool to install on someone's computer, and that's it. You no longer have to risk uh, the spy's life. It doesn't cost that much money sometimes, and it's really not as complicated as doing a kinetic war or kinetic spying. Uh, this brought many countries to have a disproportional power sometimes. It no longer has to do with how big and wealthy your country is. Look, for example, at North Korea. Uh, they've been spying all over the world all the time, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they are financially a very weak country. Uh, so today I say that we are in a Cold War. It's no longer between, you know, uh, Russia and the U.S. back in the 60s. It's happening today. It's happening right now. And it's happening between all the countries, even the ones that seem to be very, very, very good friends. They hug one another in the U.N., but uh, underneath the surface, there are a lot of things going on. And this is something we should remember uh, throughout the talk and generally in your life, you should always remember that there are so many things happening uh, behind the scenes and underneath the surface, a lot of different interests that we're not aware of. And again, friendly countries who, want, who just wants to know what is going on with another country who is their friend, or at least so they say. I call it from the dirty bomb to the dirty worm because people just spread them around and get the intel they want from another country. So a couple of things about myself. This is me. Uh, I'm Shira. As, as Bernard pr presented, I have served in the Israeli military for many years. And after that, I, I got uh, to civil life and wasn't sure what exactly do I want to do. So I got into cybersecurity, uh, joined a cloud security company that was acquired by Checkpoint. And I also uh, co-lead the Israeli OWASP uh, chapter. I hope you have a chapter over here in Riga, and if not, I will be happy to talk to some of you later on. I also try to help women get into cybersecurity. Uh, it's not uh, specifically because they are women, it's just because I'm not seeing enough women in the industry. I ask myself, why are we not seeing enough women? And uh, what I came to realize was that women don't see other women in this industry, so they just assume it's not for women. So this is when I decided to do public speaking. I wanted to show women that it's okay, there are women in this industry, and please join us so that we will have more. Uh, let's get back to talking about cybersecurity. So I would like to point out some, some challenges that we have today in uh, modern warfare. Maybe I'll get back there. Okay, so first challenge that we have is detection. Because if, again, in the kinetic war, uh, we would have a radar that identifies a bomb or, or a missile uh, shooted at you, so today, okay, maybe you have a firewall, maybe you have an antivirus, but are these enough to detect that you're being targeted, that you're being attacked? Absolutely not. Uh, the best uh, cyber attack is definitely the one that goes undetected and the one that you're unaware of. This is the most successful uh, cyber attack. It's the best way to conduct cyber war between two, uh, two targets. Damage and impact. So again, if in the kinetic war we wanted to see this big mushroom of fire, uh, the damage in cyber warfare 
the best damage is the one that you're unaware of. When your data was stolen and you're unaware of that, when someone installed a backdoor to your network and you're unaware of that, this is the best damage that you can get. Another very special impact that cybersecurity has is the psychological effect. Uh, it's the one that makes people just terrified, but they're not exactly sure why. When there is a bomb, so you know someone attacked your country, so my country is going to defend itself and attack back. But when a cybersecurity incident is happening, you're not exactly sure what happened. Is this an accident? Is this an attack? Who did it and why? Uh, this is also a problem to do uh, defense this way because you're not exactly sure what is it that you need to defend. Is it only uh, the crown jewels of the country? But if the country is using a third-party supplier, which is not a, a country company, so do we need to protect that as well? I don't know. Now, the last thing is attribution. Uh, sometimes countries who have been attacked don't want to uh, publicly uh, admit that they've been attacked. And another problem in cybersecurity is that you can always say that it wasn't you. How can you prove it was me? What, because of this code? Come on, this code, code is online, available for everyone. A, a Russian hacker can use it, a Chinese hacker can use it. How can you prove that I used it? So there is a problem of attribution because, first of all, you're not exactly sure who did it sometimes. And then very often, you just don't want to admit you've been hacked at all. Um, I will talk a little bit about the differences between uh, criminal hackers versus state-sponsored hackers, just so that we kind of get the understanding of, of these two different worlds that are actually very strongly connected to one another. There is a very, very, very thin line between the two. And countries are actually using uh, criminal hackers to, to gain uh, exactly what they want. One of the great examples for that is actually Russian hackers. Uh, Russia often approaches its uh, uh, criminal hackers and saying, oh, we really love what you did over here. We just want to use your tool or just put these few lines of code inside of your tool if you would like to keep your head attached to your body. It's really up to you. And then they just use uh, the criminal hacker tools to do whatever it is that they want. And again, the problem of attribution is growing bigger because it's a criminal hacker. It's really hard to keep trace on them uh, compared to the, to the state-sponsored hackers. So let's talk about the goals of the different hackers. So when talking about the criminal hackers, one of their biggest goals today is money or money equivalent. This is why we often find them uh, breaking into... Uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, stock exchanges or just uh, hacking to bank accounts and stealing money. So this is really, uh, so sometimes it's very, very easy money. Um, private data, I would say it's a money equivalent because uh, you can sell it or you can use it to hack someone's bank account. So it's also very valuable. The last goal that I will talk about is raise awareness. I'm talking about hacktivists, about hackers who are not looking for financial profit, but they're looking to uh, raise awareness about some issues somewhere in the world. Uh, so they do some kind of defacement or DDoS, again, uh, depending on what is it exactly that they want to get. Um, the state-sponsored hackers, uh, the first uh, goal that they wanna, want to gain is know all your secrets. Why? Because they just want to, because it will be useful someday. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know why, so let's just gain as much, in, as much information that we can and find a use for that later. Next um, is deliver a message. Sometimes they want to tell you, uh, listen, we're the sheriff in this town, or stop doing that thing that you're doing. Just deliver a message to another country by annoying them online. Um, financial or trade advantage, this is something that uh, countries like China often do. Uh, they just hack to uh, universities or to research institutes and just try to get their IP so that they, they can copycat whatever it is that they're doing and get some advantage. Easter egg is a very interesting thing. Easter egg is the kind of hacks that uh, are better gone undetected and you do not see their damage. You just leave a back door or a small bump somewhere so that in case your country wants to start a war someday with another country, they can start it digitally. They will explode that bomb whenever they find relevant. So they actually might leave that little code 
in, in the network for many years. No one's ever going to know about it or not, so don't piss them off. Uh, this connects to the destruction and chaos. Very often, the damage that will be created is not physical. It's more psychological. Uh, imagine you driving around, and all of a sudden, all the traffic lights are not working. This is going to be very, very chaotic. Imagine you taking the train to work every day, but sometimes one day, the train just stops working. This is very, very, very chaotic, and this can be easily caused uh, by a cyber hack. So if we kind of sum it up, maybe you should change batteries for these. Can we get another one, please? You can also click my computer. So uh, maybe I'll just keep talking. Uh, so in the state-sponsored attacks, uh, we can see that the damage is, is not something that we can see, and maybe we will never know about it at all. Thank you. Uh, um, and there is no immediate impact compared to the, the damage that we see for the criminal hackers, which is detectable immediately. You know that you've been hacked. You know that your data is traded. Um, let's talk about the source and the, uh, the sources and the tools that the hackers are using. So for the criminal hacker, uh, we have very often they use generic uh, open, uh, open source tools, Mimikatz uh, and Shodan and stuff like that that anyone can use online. Uh, they use leak tools like the ones that, that, that were leaked uh, from the NSA by the shadow brokers, for example, or any other, um, uh, you know, malware that was found in the wild and you can then take and create a variant of. Uh, the most important tool is people. People make mistakes, which makes uh, the life of the hackers much easier, um, and they just exploit those mistakes. They use known exploits because, again, we people don't patch which is very, very bad, but very good and easy for the hackers. Uh, you will often find them to be script kitties or white, gray hacker kind of people. And this is definitely not like the resources and the tools that the state-sponsored hackers have. These are the best engineers and academics in the world. They have all the money in the world that they need and all the compute resources that they need to create the best tools in the world, to find zero days, um, to get, you know, if you need a crypto expert who is very, very, very hard to find, yeah, they'll find it and they will use it and they will uh, use his expertise to whatever it is that they want. And there is also international support because countries help one another in whatever it is that they want. Uh, I checked on Wikileaks and it says that Stuxnet was written by Israel and the US. So if this is true, then this is a very, very, very successful um, cooperation. And we see other countries helping one another whenever they need. Uh, they give one another their zero days or they share intelligence, depending on what is it that they need at that moment. Um, techniques and methods. Uh, so for the criminal hacker, they really go for the money. They spray around. Uh, they trust that the human will make a mistake. They distribute their attacks. It's a very statistical thing. They know that the more they spread around, the higher chances are that someone will click that link, someone will open that file, and this is all they need. So it doesn't cost, uh, it costs the same if you uh, email 1,000 people or 10,000 people. One of them will click the link and you will make your profit. So it's going to work. Unlike the state-sponsored hackers, uh, that really need to define what is it that they want. Keep your eyes on the prize and plan ahead. You need to craft this very, very, very well and also go low and slow. Don't hurry. You need to plan this. And again, if you want to be undetected, you're not in a hurry. You can take your time. It can take months. It can take years. Take as much time as you need to craft the best attack. Uh, it's not limited to digital vectors. If you have a, an intelligence agency behind you, then you can use UMINT. You can send uh, an agent to sniff around. You can send them to connect the Wi-Fi in the interesting building that you care about. Uh, you can use other factors as well and not just digital tools. 
And one of the most important things for state-sponsored attacks is leave persistence. Leave a way to get back to wherever it is, even if you've been detected, even if you've been hacked, you always want uh, a way back in case you need it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the way you got in, but you, you, you leave a way to get back even if you get detected. So even if you feel like you found a new APT, always think about how are they gonna get back after they know I'm onto them. So let's talk about some real interesting things that happened around the world. Uh, first of all, let's talk about this interesting incident, the light or uh, the blackout in Ukraine. Um, this is the first uh, blackout caused by cybersecurity that we know of. Perhaps there were other incidents in the past, but again, we talked about the attribution and not admitting that you've been hacked at all. So maybe, maybe other things happened in the past, but this is the first one that we know of that was caused by cyber. Uh, I will try to be gentle here about uh, politics and about what's going on between different countries. And, you know, I don't judge, but it seems like uh, Ukraine is the playground uh, of Russia for cybersecurity tools. Um, if this is true, of course, and if this is in fact Russia who hacked uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, power grid. Um, so, so it seems like uh, perhaps Russia was trying to deliver some kind of message. Again, I'm not sure to who. They've may, they may have been trying to deliver a message to the Ukrainians uh, because they've been having their issues for some time now. Uh, or maybe the message is not even for Ukraine. Maybe it's for someone else. Russia is also involved in other places in the world doing other things. And maybe they're saying, hey, see what we did in Ukraine? Don't mess with us. Also could be that way. So we're talking about December of uh, 2015. December is a cold month. I don't have to tell that to you. For me, what's going on here outside is winter. So December is, is I can't even think about December over here. And uh, December of 2015 in Ukraine, uh, in some city, uh, all of a sudden, five in the afternoon, people are on their way back home and there are no lights. There is no electricity. You cannot use the elevator, you cannot use the train. Uh, this affected about 250,000 people for three to six hours. And we need to understand that this is not just a single power plant. Uh, that area had three different electricity companies with more than 27 substations using equipment of at least three different uh, companies. So this is not a a hack of a specific, it's not like an exploit that someone find with a specific uh, company. This was a very, very, very well-crafted attack because you had to coordinate uh, many substations using different equipment. This is not something you can do by chance. Uh, this is not something some script kitty can do. This had to be very, very well-planned. Think about you uh, organizing something or coordinating something very complicated, like making dinner to your friends, okay? So think about different dishes that you, can, you, you need to make, and then asking one of your friends to bring beer or wine, and then setting up the table. So it's not like that. If we needed people to actually operate remotely the ICS, this is not just some kind of hacker who decided to be brave. This is a very well-planned hack that had to be tested somewhere. They had to test and see that everything is working smoothly. I don't know where did they try it out, but truth be told, it worked out very, very, very well for them. It was coordinated perfectly at the same time for all substations. So let's talk about what had to happen in order to get to the target. So first of all, you have to do your homework very, very, very well. We know that they've used um, a phishing email here. So if you want to use a phishing email and you want this to be successful, then obviously you have to craft it. You have to think about who are you going to send the email to? What are you going to write in it? What's going to make the other person open it up? And from what we understand, this started at least six months before the act actually happened. So again, we talked about low and slow. We talked about taking your time, and the Russians did take their time on it. 
But when we're talking about phishing, um, so the, the email included, uh, you know, Excel and Word files with uh, macros, uh, which is, you know, best practices for these kind of things. But again, when, when the research was conducted around this, they re realized that the sender wasn't spoofed. It was a legitimate email sent from a legitimate person within the organization. And that means that patient zero was perhaps the sender who really sent files that were infected beforehand. And this is why it was harder to detect this kind of incident. So it actually started not by the phishing email, but by hacking the sender of the email. So uh, phishing email sent, files clicked, and we started process of uh, the reconnaissance of moving around and creating credentials um, to actually operate uh, the power plant. Um, so this is kind of a process that uh, I'm sure uh, all of you are, are aware of, and I don't have to explain much about it. But you're probably, probably asking yourself, OK, you got to maybe the, the management uh, network, where it makes sense that you open up emails. But this is definitely not the operating uh, network of the, of the ICS. What happened here? We had to make some kind of hop between the two networks. How was this possible? They are air-gapped. So uh, communication between the two networks was made with um, RDP with no MFA. So it was unfortunately fairly easy uh, to hop between the two networks. And at the target, what exactly happened? So we already understand uh, the power was out. How was it out? Uh, the Russians deleted the firmware of the, of the uh, breakers who controlled the power and it installed their own firmware. So that made, uh, made uh, the technicians, they, it, gave, it gave them a very hard work to, uh, they had to actually go and touch each and every device and reinstall the correct firmware. Now, if that wasn't enough, uh, they also um, deleted the bootmaster files from the workstations. So again, we had to send the technicians to touch each and every computer and reinstall it. And someone was feeling really funny. And in addition to that, they put in like kind of a little bonus and DDoSed the phone uh, centers, the call centers of uh, the Ukrainian electricity companies so that whenever uh, an angry or confused customer wanted to call them and ask what is going on, they just got uh, no response. I will not go over, I will not show you this little movie, but you can see it on YouTube. It just shows the, uh, one of the uh, Ukrainian engineers uh, not touching their computer and showing that someone is remotely operating uh, the power plant. Uh, it's very nice to see, and you'd probably say, okay, but they're over it now, and they're all better now. This was in 2015, but in August, uh, we saw other Ukrainian people uh, connecting their computers to mine Bitcoin from some kind of power plant. So this is great. We just don't learn from our own mistakes, and this is why hacking will keep on happening and being successful. So... Kudos to the Russians, it was great work. I, I was very, very, very impressed, specifically by the management skills of this operation. Um, another very important thing to say, earlier this year, there was a power blackout in Venezuela. And people in Venezuela immediately said that it was the Americans who, who caused it. And I don't know who really caused it, but it doesn't really matter. The truth is that we're actually talking about it, that we're talking about more cyber uh, attacks happening. It doesn't matter if, if Americans, or it doesn't matter if it was really cyber or not. The fact is that we're afraid of it, and that whenever something weird is going on, we just ask ourselves if this is a cyber attack or not. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about two other countries that we don't get to talk about much in this area of the world, um, China and Australia. So these two countries have very, very, very strong ties, especially financially. Um, uh, uh, China is buying a third of everything that Australia exports and actually sending more than one million tourists and students a year to Australia. So Australia is very much dependent um, uh, on China. 
And on February 2019, it was announced or it was discovered that Australia was hacked. And the Australian Prime Minister said that uh, it was a very sophisticated hack that was made by another country. Um, who might that be? I'm not sure, but that, that country hacked the network of the parliament, the network of the Labour Party, uh, and the network of... Um, I forgot the second party that they have. But anyway, they hacked both parties. Like, they didn't uh, discriminate or they didn't choose uh, one of the sides. They just hacked uh, the both of them. Um, and why exactly would they do that? We don't know what did they steal. Uh, what kind of data did they steal? Um, but we can assume that uh, at the moment of truth, they will just unveil some kind of embarrassing uh, correspondence or embarrassing email or embarrassing information depending on the candidate that they support more. Uh, or also just to make the Australian citizens distrust their government and, uh, and their state. Uh, this hack happened uh, three months before the elections in Australia. And this is not the first time that we hear about hacks that happened prior to elections. Uh, we know that back in 2016, it also happened in the US. Uh, so this is kind of a best practices, and we can definitely expect to see more of these happening uh, in the coming years whenever we see uh, election campaigns around the world. Um, so, as for the attribution part, well, the Australian intelligence uh, published a report saying that they blame China for this, whereas the Australian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs asked not to publish this report because they do not want to hurt their relations with China. So, if it's China or not, I don't know, but it looks like it is. There were also some tools that are uh, referred to China found uh, in that network. But of course, we said before that open source tools can be used by anyone, actually. But this is not really the first time uh, China is doing such thing. Uh, back in 2013, uh, uh, the Chinese were blamed to hack into a contractor that was involved in building uh, the new office for the Australian intelligence, stealing their blueprints. Uh, that means that they know how the networks are wired and where are the server uh, rooms and what do the rooms look like, making uh, hacking and spying much easier. And uh, on, in 2015, uh, um, Chinese hack again to the Russian uh, Bureau of Meteorology. Now you would say, okay, but this is so boring. Who cares about that? And I understand why you say that, but actually uh, this data is very, very valuable for financial reasons, for financial predictions. Uh, and as we said before, if, if uh, Australia is very much dependent uh, on China and on how they buy things, if China can predict what are the uh, next year's crops are going to be like, well, they can plan and better price whatever it is that they want. Um, so China is doing a very, very intensive and spreading around work uh, to get everything that they want from Australia. Now, I'm about to finish, but uh, I often get asked about Israel because I come from Israel and what does Israel exactly do in the cyberspace. So first of all, if you want to know more about it, check out the Darknet Diaries, episode 28, about unit 8200. Um, yes, Israel is in the cyberspace. Israel is one of the top five countries uh, to work in cyberspace. Uh, and we try, to do, uh, we try to do things that we find uh, good in the world. Uh, we try to stop terror attacks. Uh, this is just one example to something that was published. Most of them are obviously not published. Um, but uh, this was a specific incident about a, an ISIS attack that was supposed to happen in Australia, and the Israeli uh, authorities announced or al alerted uh, the Australians about it, and it was, uh, it was then stopped. So this is uh, a very short thing about uh, what we do around. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me today. Uh, and we have time for a, a question, I think. So mining Bitcoin on the power plant makes sense because that's where the power is. Um, absolutely, just makes 
Bitcoin mining faster, most likely. Since you are an expert in cloud security, how do you see that the cloud is changing the current battlefield for the cyberspace? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? It's different, of course. Um, what happens in the cloud is that there is really no more perimeter that we can defend. If in the past we had, uh, we had our on-prem, we had our data center, and everything had to go to the internet through one gateway. So if anyone wanted to hack us, they had to go through that gateway. There was no other way in and out. Today in the cloud, I say that there is no, there is no vague parameter. The parameter is, no, is not different. It just doesn't exist anymore because you can hack the cloud uh, through permissions and roles or through uh, an exploitable service that you're using in the cloud or through misconfiguration or because today there is no visibility to your cloud. If, if in the data center world we had a Visio that was very structured and we knew what does our network look like, Today, in the cloud era, uh, security engineers, DevOps engineers have no idea what is their uh, cloud posture, where are their assets, who is managing them. So hacking is fairly easier, but it's a little more complicated as well because we need to learn about new ways to hack the cloud. But it's happening and it's here. Thank you. One, in, one person in the audience wants to know who earns more, state? or a criminal hacker? Who earns more? Yeah, a state or criminal hacker. I think that these two, let's call it industries, uh, kind of feed one another. Uh, because if you have a criminal hacker doing something bad, then you'd also want the industry to create a solution for that. So in Israel, we just build a startup around that so we can stop that uh, specific vector from happening. Uh, and then the hackers uh, think about uh, you know, a new way to bypass that or to a new way to hack. So we come up with another startup to, that's going to block that as well. And this industry is feeding itself. So actually... I'm sending this back to you. Uh, do we really want to keep on feeding this? This is a, a kind of a race between the hackers and the states, and uh, the world is getting more and more connected and more and more complicated. So we need to come up with a way to keep it safe uh, and private for ourselves. The final question from my side. Maybe it's more a yes or no um, answer. Do you think that the zero-day market currently, which is in the hands of the private organizations, is that a good thing or a bad thing, and how it can impact the cyber war that we have future? Even the fact that we have a market for this is kind of a problem. The fact that we have a zero-day, think about yourselves, you bought a new car, you drive around, but it has a very, very serious default in, a, in the brakes, okay? And you don't know about it, uh, you would want the car to get recalled and fixed. And the, the manufacturer of the car has to fix it, and he's responsible for that. But Microsoft, yeah, they patch, but they don't, I don't feel like they feel responsible for their zero days. I don't feel that Cisco is responsible for their zero days. So the problem, in my opinion, starts with them, with them not being responsible for the products that they give us. Because you wouldn't they're driving a car with the brakes maybe not working. So why are you using an operating system that maybe is not safe? Right. Thank you. Let's thank Shira again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.